Um, all right, well, let's go ahead and kind of get going here. Um, so uh, my name is Dr. Chris Cox. Uh, I'm a chiropractor here at Lifeline Wellness Center. And uh, part of the reason we do uh, these particular uh, lectures is really uh, community education. Um, I think probably most people uh, kind of get the idea that our healthcare system today as it exists is very, very, very broken. And part of our objective is to actually correct that. So uh, we really do envision people living a, a very vital dynamic life and that requires us to really be at our very best. And simple fundamental things about health and well-being uh, uh, tell us that our body is designed to function perfectly without drugs and surgery. So, um, so those are things that um, we want to encourage of how does a person actually get their body to function perfectly. And when that occurs, the quality of life and uh, how they show up in life is exponentially better and they have a better life experience. So not only do they get that benefit, but so does everybody around them. So it really is about being your best and uh, many people come to us because they uh, are in a position where they have had the realization that they need to transform their health. It's no longer acceptable where they are. And uh, that's what they're here for, is to, to send their health on a different path and really make a, a quantifiable, measurable difference in their quality of life. So, uh, so that's what we help people do, is really transform. So today uh, is all about cholesterol. And in essence, why everything you know, or maybe everything you've heard, is completely and totally wrong. Right? So we're going to cover a bunch of different stuff today. Um, so I want to start off just briefly, like what actually is cholesterol, uh, and correct some of these kind of mis, um, uh, mis thing or uh, misrepresentations. So cholesterol is actually a, a waxy substance that's found in, in almost every cell of your uh, entire body. Um, and is essential to good health, right? So it's not actually a bad thing, right? It plays a role in things like hormone production, it plays a role in digestion, uh, actually the man uh, manufacturing of vitamin D following sun exposure, which helps protect your cell membranes, right? So cholesterol actually is a, is a vital piece of being healthy. So it's not like this horrible thing that you should never have, it's, it's critical for actually being healthy. Um, so the, actually the American Heart Association now recommends that you balance your cholesterol levels at about 150 milligrams per deciliter. Um, but according to old or, and unfounded science, uh, your total cholesterol or the sum of all the cholesterol in your body is not a gauge of your heart disease risk. So when your uh, levels are actually measured, elevated levels of, of triglycerides are not actually taken into account. So uh, again, it, cholesterol level is not like the, the end all be all. There's, there's a lot of different details that tell us uh, things that you need to know uh, about it. So, um, so this is what we hear most often. It's what most people really think. It's bad for you, right? So there's like good cholesterol and bad cholesterol and all that kind of stuff. But it's been vilified uh, as a primary cause of cardiovascular disease. Yet there are numerous studies that actually completely tell us the exact opposite, that actually demonstrate the, the like I said, the actual, the actual opposite, that cholesterol has virtually nothing to do with heart disease, uh, at least not in the way that we conventionally kind of think about it or way that conventional medicine pr uh, presents it. Um, so as one C researcher noticed, the, uh, noted, uh, the idea that there is good and bad cholesterol is also wrong. So this researcher, his name is Harkham. Uh, so low density lipoprotein, so or LDLs, right? And high density lipoprotein, which is HDLs, are actually not cholesterol, right? They're carriers or transporters of cholesterol, triglycerides, phospholipids, and proteins. So, um, so most people have heard of this idea of good and bad uh, cholesterol, but that's not actually true. So the, the LDL and HDL are actually the transporters of cholesterol. So, uh, and so this next slide, that cholesterol actually cannot truly indicate your risk of heart disease. That's one of the, the first major misconceptions, right? So for the past like 60 years, the US dietary advice has really warned against eating cholesterol rich foods. And they basically claim that cholesterol promotes arterial plaque from forming, um, uh, the, the arterial plaque that, that leads to heart disease. 
Uh, so we now have overwhelming evidence to the exact opposite of that. But this kind of dogmatic thinking can really be present to say the least, right? I, I mean, every day, uh, how many times do we hear from, from our medical community that, oh, your cholesterol is high, here's your medication, right? So we now know without a, a shadow of a doubt, right? After, after decades of, um, of research, it's failed to demonstrate a correlation between dietary cholesterol and heart disease, right? So um, the actual 2015, 2020 dietary guidelines for Americans finally addressed the scientific shortcoming announcing cholesterol is not considered a nutrient of concern for overconsumption, right? So we don't have to actually, they're actually stating now, it's clear, we don't have to worry about overconsuming uh, consumption, right? However, uh, to this day, the evidence keeps coming in, right? Showing there's no link between the two. However, our medical community still operates from this antiquated paradigm that cholesterol is this bad thing and it's supposed to be vilified, um, with, as uh, again, we've already talked about, it's just simply just isn't true. Well, how did we actually get this idea? Well, years ago, the first science evidence linking trans fats to heart disease and kind of exonerating these you know, saturated fats uh, as the bad thing was published in 1957. Uh, it was a biochemist uh, by uh, the name of Kumaro, and uh, unfortunately, his research actually over, was overshadowed by another researcher's uh, study, um, and which basically said it linked saturated fat to heart disease. Well, if we fast forward a few years, uh, reanalysis of this second study revealed that data had actually been cherry picked to produce the link. But by then, the kind of the whole saturated fat myth was already kind of firmly entrenched. And uh, we were kind of acting from the perspective that this was actually true, um, which again, it's, it's just simply not. So what actually uh, is the truth? Well, guidelines published for eating fats continue to be confused with a basic premise. And dietary fat uh, is associated with heart disease, but it is processed vegetable oils loaded with trans fats and damaged omega-3s that are producing the problem, not saturated fats. So specifically, here's what results uh, the researchers actually found, right? So adults over the age of 60 with higher LDL levels generally live longer, okay? Well, that's, that's actually complete opposite to what we've been told, right? But the research actually says something else. Total cholesterol levels are generally not predictive of risk of heart disease and may be absent or inverse in many studies, right? So everything, again, we're told that, oh, we got to keep your total cholesterol levels low because it's going to reduce the risk of, of heart disease. And then if they're too high, it's going to cause heart disease. And it's just simply, the research says, it's just simply not true. There, there are tons of research studies that say just the opposite. And then the last kind of big piece is that very few adults who experience um, um, kind of uh, genetic or familial uh, high cholesterol uh, died prematurely. So in essence, there's actually very little correlation between high cholesterol in, in families and dying prematurely. So there's actually very little evidence that actually supports that. So just because, you know, your father had high cholesterol doesn't mean that you're going to, you know, have a problem with high cholesterol and have issues. So there is no evidence that supports that either. But again, we still act if this, that's true. Well, so here's another study. Um, so uh, that just simply states that, that there's evidence supporting the use of cholesterol-lowering statin drugs to lower your risk of heart disease is, get this, slim to none. And it is likely little more than manufactured work of statin makers. At least that's an implied conclusion of a scientific review published uh, in uh, 2018 um, for, uh, by the title Expert Review of Clinical Pharmacology. So again, this whole like statin drugs to lower your cholesterol levels, to lower the risk for heart disease is, is the research is just not there, right? And again, it's, it's likely due to manufacturing this kind of fear-based uh, kind of reaction from the actual manufacturers or the pharmaceutical companies. Now in 2018, this review identifies significant flaws in three recent studies 
uh, published by Staten Advocates, which interesting, right? So who do you suppose that was, right? Well, we all know that's uh, um, uh, pharmaceutical companies. And these reviews attempted to validate the current dogma or the current belief system. So the papers uh, present substantial evidence that total cholesterol and low density lipoproteins or, or the LDL cholesterol uh, levels are not an indication of heart disease risk and that statin treatment is of doubtful benefit as a form of primary prevention for this reason. So again, we've been sold this bill of goods that just simply isn't true. And as time goes on, we actually receive more and more and more information and research that says that supports that. It just simply isn't true. Now, it's one thing if statins just didn't have an effect, but here's the problem. They're actually, there's actually trouble. There's dangers of statins. So um, so website drugs.com, which is a great resource for, for basic information, state that 35 million people on statins often experience many different side effects. Uh, liver damage, for instance, is said to be rare, implying that ongoing liver tests while taking statins aren't uh, likely aren't necessary. However, some doctors say that you'll need a baseline liver function test beforehand. Now, the most common side effects of statins are headaches, muscle pain, back pain or side pain or like flank pain, uh, nasal congestion, congestion or stuffiness or runny nose. So uh, most people would make a connection between allergy type symptoms and then taking their statins, right? So difficulty sleeping is another side effect. Constipation is a common one uh, and also hoarseness of your voice, right? Well, in, in just in case you needed another source to implicate statins role in, in psychiatric problems, in April of 2018, a study came out that found that lowering cholesterol levels in men via a statin could bring about changes in nerve cell membranes and behavior. So not only will it create you know, those forces in your voice and sinus problems and sleeping problems and headaches and muscle pain, it also affects your actually the, the psychological state of your brain, specifically the study relative to men. Um, so, it's uh, when we start to, to expand the scope is that many people, um, and this is you know, 25 years of healthcare speaking, aren't just taking one medication, right? They have uh, the one medication that they're taking and then they also have diabetes, right? So when we start to combine these two things, well, statin drugs are designed to reduce cholesterol levels and cholesterol does not actually call, cause heart disease, right? All risks associated with the medication come without any benefit to your health, right? So we already know, like we talked about the statins don't do anything. In fact, they're not neutral, they're actually negative, right? Well, the trend for prescribing statin drugs is concerning and particularly relevant to diabetics whose underlying disease increases the risk of heart disease. So uh, here are some of the additional side effects that could be more prevalent for those living with diabetes, right? So generally, people with diabetes are gonna be more prone to urinary tract infections, they're more prone to dizziness or partial loss of sensitivity or sensory, uh, sensory stimuli. So basically balance type issues, those are more prominent when people are taking a statin and they have diabetes. It distorts their taste. Uh, they start to have memory issues and headaches. Uh, people with diabetes tend to have more gastrointestinal issues when they're taking a statin. So things like diarrhea, indigestion, nausea, intestinal gas, constipation, uh, bloating, vomiting, pancreatitis, they also tend to have metabolic issues, so uh, they're prone to having uh, more abnormal liver function tests, hyperglycemia, hepatitis, uh, hunger issues like anorexia, uh, experiencing more weight gain. They experience musculoskeletal problems, so joint pain, pain in the extremities, muscle spasms, uh, joint swelling, back pain, uh, muscle fatigue, muscle wasting, uh, and also Lou Gehrig's disease, right, or ALS. Um, and then in cardiovascular uh, kind of risks, uh, the increases death, death in up to 10% of the patients. So um, it, it's a significant impact of, of these statins. Again, just being prescribed to people that don't have diabetes, but when you, when you stack you know, the, the statin prescription on top of diabetics, um, the, the increase in, in symptoms is, is substantial. Well, 
is uh, you guys probably already know there's a significant overprescription of, of statins, right? So rather than pointing patients in the direction of finding dietary solutions, including eating both the whites and the yolks when having eggs, right? You need both. In ditching processed vegetable oils in, fla in favor of more healthy oils like coconut oil or olive oil or avocado oil. Uh, Harvard Medical School recently updated an article on how to manage muscle pain from taking statins, perpetuating the cholesterol myth. Now, this, this drives me crazy, right? Is that we have Harvard, Harvard Health Medical School actually stating something to do in opposition to what the, the, the research actually says. So they said, if you're not taking a statin now, you may as well be soon. These medications are commonly prescribed to lower bad cholesterol, right, the LDL cholesterol, um, and have been shown to reduce the risk of heart attack, stroke, and death. They are, routinely they are routinely recommended for people who have cardiovascular disease, and for many people ages 40 to 75 who don't have cardiovascular disease but have at least one risk factor, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, or smoking, and a 7.5% greater risk of stroke or heart attack in the next decade. So this is, this is exactly the type of nonsense that's out there that confuses everybody because here we have Harvard Medical School and I think most people would, would hear the name Harvard would think, oh, this, this is someplace that we can trust, right? It has a good reputation. Reality, it, they, are, <laughs> they are unfortunately backed by pharmaceutical companies, right? That are selling this stuff and it's the same old story, right? So it's just simply not true and the research supports the, the opposite of what they're telling us. Well, so there's also some alternative causes of heart disease, right? So let's really look at what we do need to be aware of, right? So biased research launched uh, a low fat myth and reshaped the food industries for decades to come, right? I mean, uh, I've been around long enough for everybody to, um, the whole low fat kind of, um, kind of uh, craze, so to speak. Um, so uh, as saturated fat and cholesterol were rejected, manufacturers switched to using trans fats and sugar to add taste to processed foods. Well, these changes increased the inflammation levels in our body and drove a whole new lever of disease process, meaning trans fats and, and additional sugar to processed foods did way more harm than actually just eating uh, saturated fat and cholesterol, right? So over an extended period of time, the chronic inflammation silently damages your tissues and arterial walls, which your body attempts to repair. So these repairs may build over time and create plaque, potentially breaking off and blocking smaller arteries in the heart brain uh, triggering a heart attack or stroke. Now this process can go on for years without being noticed as chronic inflammation um, uh, doesn't really have a lot of apparent situation, uh, symptoms right away. But research has actually demonstrated deficiencies in, and excesses of certain micronutrients like folate and vitamin E and zinc, which may result in an ineffect or, or excessive inflammatory response. So this kind of buying into, um, you know, that, that saturated fat is bad and cholesterol is bad, and then replacing it with trans fats and more sugar has actually created a much larger problem than we ever started with. Well, um, so high cholesterol actually could lead to a longer life, right? So this is kind of what we're here for. If I told you this, you know, an hour ago, you'd be like, well, I'm not sure I believe that. Well, the reality is the study shows Studies show, according to a recent Japanese study uh, published in the uh, Annals of Nutrition and Metabolism, older people with high LDL, or the formerly bad cholesterol, generally live just as long and, and actually may outlive people with low levels of LDLs, right? So while the reason behind this finding is still being totally flushed out, like why this really happens, studies thus far have discovered few factors that could be at play. Right, so number one, cholesterol may protect against infections and atherosclerosis, uh, as many of uh, the many observations that conflict with the LDL kind of hypothesis may be explained by the idea that high serum cholesterol, which is the serum that's in your blood, and or high LDL is protective against infection and this atherosclerosis, right? So cholesterol may protect against cancer, Although in previous cases uh, where low cholesterol was linked to cancer, 
Uh, exclusions were made to tip the scales, such as excluding possible prior drug treatment, um, a, a specific type of cholesterol-lowering drug um, before statins, uh, leaving questions open as to whether it was the, the low cholesterol that caused the cancer or the drug treatments that contributed to it. So in other words, um, the, the studies were skewed uh, because they were using a different medication uh, and because of that, it didn't show the true results that people with higher cholesterol actually had lower cancer levels. So low cholesterol uh, and violence in psychiatric patients have been linked. And there's also an association between low cholesterol and suicide dating back to more than a decade. Right? So uh, the idea behind fats or, or cholesterol actually being a part of brain health and neural health is, is really important as well. Well, and that kind of brings me to this next piece is cholesterol in the brain. Right? So a quarter of all the cholesterol in your body is found in your brain, where it uh, performs uh, the function of an antioxidant. Right? Uh, a number of studies have demonstrated that contrary to what most people believe, high cholesterol levels are associated with better brain health. Right? So if you want, if you want good brain function, make sure your cholesterol levels are high. Right? Now, what's interesting, what do you think is, you know, people with things like Parkinson's and dementia and stuff like that, well, do they also have, uh, is it common that they're also on a statin, right, to lower uh, cholesterol levels? It's very, very common, right? So cholesterol also plays a, an important role in the formation of memories and is vital for healthy neurologic function. So it's actually been shown to increase low levels of cholesterol, have been shown to increase your risk of depression and suicide, and in some cases, really, really significantly. So another, uh, another number of studies have demonstrated that the importance of high cholesterol for the prevention of neurodegenerative diseases, things like Alzheimer's. So again, the idea that we, we want this higher cholesterol. Now, if we go back over you know, 20, 30 years, right, we've been told that cholesterol is all bad, right? So we've been trying to lower this cholesterol. Well, what have we seen increase over the last 20 or 30 years? Well, things like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and all that kind of stuff. So is there a correlation? No. Uh, there isn't a study that directly states that, but when we start to stand back and look at the trends and patterns, I find it pretty interesting. So, <clears throat> excuse me, another thing to really focus on is how you metabolize iron, and that's relative to disease. So, um, there's a what's called a meta analysis, which basically looks at a, a bunch of different studies back in 2013 that demonstrated a positive relationship between iron and cardiovascular disease. So basically with higher iron levels being linked to a higher risk of disease. So iron creates an environment for what's called oxidative stress, right? So we take antioxidants to, to balance out oxidative stress. So iron creates oxidative stress uh, and excess iron may increase your inflammation and increase your risk of heart disease. So an ideal level for adult men and non-menstruating women is between 40 and 60 nanograms per milliliter. Uh, but you do not want to be below 80 or, I'm sorry, below 20 or above 80. So that, that kind of 40 to 60 is where you want to be. Well, um, iron overload, uh, unfortunately, the first things people think about when they hear uh, iron is anemia or iron deficiency, not realizing that iron overload is actually a more common problem and actually more dangerous. Well, while your body requires sufficient iron to stay healthy, too much is actually linked to things like cancer and heart disease, uh, Alzheimer's, uh, gouty arthritis, hepatitis C, liver disease, and lots of other different things. So we gotta be careful, like it's not so much about it being low, but actually being high, right? um, So how do you actually keep your iron levels in check? Well, the simplest and most efficient way to lower your iron level is to donate blood, right? So it's kind of a win-win, right? You get healthy and, um, and uh, people get blood, uh, people who need blood get. So if you can't donate, then a therapeutic phlebotomy is actually effective and will eliminate the excess iron. Uh, so uh, that's something that most blood banks can do. Uh, you can go in and just do it just like you'd be donating blood. Uh, there's also some other factors that could be contributing to excessive iron levels, right? So number one would be cooking in iron pots and pans. Uh, cooking acidic foods in these types of pots and pans will cause even higher levels uh, of iron absorption. So if that's something that you're doing, you might, and you have high iron levels, you want to be aware of that. 
Um, eating processed foods such as cereals, uh, white bread uh, fortified with iron, um, and what's uh, especially bad actually about this is that the iron used in these products is what's called inorganic iron, which is more uh, has more in common with rust than the bioavailable iron found in meat. Right, so. So you kind of think about it, you, you don't want to buy cereals, you don't want to buy things that are fortified with iron. So when you see that, you can, you can just read it as it's fortified with rust. <laughs> and it's, it's not actually the type of iron that your body really uses. So, um, so it's not a good idea to do that. Uh, and in general, just eliminating processed foods, or at least minimizing them is a good idea. Um, drinking well water high in iron, you know, so if you're in the city, it's not necessarily a, a, a huge factor, but if you live in the suburbs and you have your own well, um, that can be a big deal. Um, so you, you just want to have some idea of uh, testing uh, where your uh, iron in your water is at um, and or using kind of a reverse osmosis water filter that'll actually filter that stuff out. Um, taking multivitamins and mineral supplements uh, is both of these frequently have iron in them. So you wanna be mindful if your iron level is already high, does your multivitamin or mineral, does it have excessive or more that you don't need? Uh, another thing is uh, regularly consuming alcohol, alcohol will actually increase uh, the absorption of iron in your diet. So I wanna be kind of mindful of that as well. Um, there's a test that you can do that will actually monitor this. And it's uh, kind of a screening test or marker, and it's called GGT. Uh, uh, it stands for uh, gamma uh, glutamyl transpeptidase. So you don't have to remember that. I'm not going to test anybody on the, on the webinar on it, but you remember it's, it's called a GGT test. I'm sorry, GGT test. Uh, it can be used as a, basically a screening marker for excess free iron in your body and is a great indicate, indicator of your, your risk of uh, sudden cardiac death. Right, so in recent years, scientists have actually discovered this test, this GGT, uh, is highly interactive with iron. And when both your serum ferritin, which is serum iron, and GGT are high, you are at a significantly increased risk of chronic health problems and early death. Because when you have a combination of free iron, which is highly toxic, and the iron storage uh, to keep that toxicity going, so hence getting this GGT test in addition to a serum test um, is advisable to rule out on your toxicity. So uh, frequency wise, you should do this like once a year, right? So it's, uh, it's a test you can re uh, request uh, from your primary care physician. So, um, so what do we do? How do we manage our risk of heart disease with actually lifestyle choices, which actually proves to be the most effective and the most healthy? Right, so here's the kind of the cool thing. When, you, when you're managing this risk of heart disease with lifestyle choices, you actually get the benefits right now. Like you don't, you don't have to wait 20 years to reap these benefits. Like making these, these changes that we'll talk about here in just a moment, you actually get the benefit right away. Like you get the payoff, right? So, um, so here's a few things. One is you wanna make sure you reduce your, what's called your net carbs and eliminate processed fructose. So replace the lost calories with higher amounts of healthy fats and, and not protein, right? So uh, more healthy fats, right? Reduce your sugars, right? Or reduce your nut carbs and, and eliminate processed foods or processed sugars. Uh, next thing you can do is you can normalize your omega-6 to omega-3 ratios. Most get far too little omega-3s. And those are things that are found in like fatty fish, which kind of on a side note is not a great way to get uh, your omega-3 is a better, a better source is actually krill oil. And most people get way too much omega-3s. So kind of how they work, omega-3s, I'm um, sorry, omega-6s turn on your inflammatory process, omega-3s turn off your inflammatory process. So you need both, but they need to be in balance. Um, so omega-6s are really plentiful in processed vegetable oils uh, and things like nuts and stuff like that. Uh, but they're also really high in processed and fried foods because of that also. Um, you can also optimize your vitamin D level by getting regular sensible sun exposure. Uh, there's different ratios. You can kind of look that up. Uh, there's a, a vitamin D coalition that has a lot of um, kind of recommendations on that. Um, but other nutrients of importance include magnesium, vitamin K2, vitamin C. Those are all important pieces. Uh, get eight hours of high quality sleep each night to normalize your hormonal system. So really critical 
uh, of getting rest. That's actually when your body heals best. Uh, and then get regular exercise. Uh, move your body as much as possible throughout the day. You know, believe it or not, we weren't designed to sit in front of a computer for eight to 10 hours a day. It's actually not healthy. So we, we do need to move our bodies. We need to eat great food. We need to make sure our nervous system is, is healthy uh, and can run and control and coordinate all the stresses and all that kind of stuff. So uh, another thing you can do is you can increase your magnesium intake. So magnesium plays a vital role in biological function in what's called mitochondrial health, which is kind of like the, the powerhouse of your cells. Uh, it's also the a culprit in development of inflammation when your levels are low. So it might play a role in inhibiting the deposit of lipids uh, in the arterial walls and plaque formation. So making sure you have enough uh, magnesium can reduce, can potentially, uh, what the research is saying is potentially reduce the plaque formation in your arteries. Um, so a century ago, your diet provided nearly 500 milligrams uh, of magnesium per day. However, courtesy to our you know, nutrient depleted soil, we might only be getting 150 milligrams per day. So your body actually flushes excess magnesium through your stools. Uh, so using magnesium citrate and monitoring stool consistency, consider starting with 200 milligrams <coughs> excuse me, of uh, oral um, magnesium citrate and gradually increasing until you develop slightly loose stools. That will actually help you gauge how much you should be supplementing. Um, so the role of inflammation in cardiovascular disease, this is really the, the key things that you need to know. For people who have you know, a, a genetic risk, you know, or it's running in their families, um, these are things that we have to be really, really, really conscious of. So there's multiple factors um, that, can, can, uh, that can affect the inflammatory process, but you have control over that. So the first one is what's called hyperinsulinemia. So basically, an excess of insulin in your body triggers uh, that's triggered by a diet, a diet high in carbohydrates. So what you eat tends to be the deal breaker in how much insulin your body secretes. However, there are other factors contributing to these insulin levels, such as smoking, sleep quality, exercise, and vitamin D levels. So kind of think about your blood sugar level. You got to be really mindful of uh, the effect that that's having your body, specifically relative to insulin. The next thing is unbalanced fatty acids, right? So your body needs a balance of these omega-3s and omega-6s. And as I kind of mentioned before, unfortunately, most people uh, have an overabundance, overabundance of this omega-6 omega fats, which is, again, this, the fats that turn on the inflammatory process um, and, and nowhere near as, as many omega-3s as they should. So you want to strive for a one-to-one -one ratio, right? As many omega-3s as omega-6. And that actually helps uh, reduce the inflammatory process. And because of that, reduces your risk for heart disease. So one thing that, that's really important to know about vegetable oil um, is, so uh, a Minnesota coronary experience was a study that was performed between 1968 and 1973 and examined the relationship between diet and heart health. So the results were left unpublished until 2016 when they appeared in the uh, British Medical Journal. Uh, so an analysis of the collected data revealed lowering your cholesterol levels through dietary intervention did not reduce your risk of death from coronary heart disease. Researchers found that for every 30 point drop in total cholesterol, there was a 22% increase in the risk of death from, from cardiac disease. So upon autopsy, the group eating vegetable oil and the group eating saturated fat had the same amount of, of atherosclerotic plaques in their arteries, but the group eating saturated fat experienced nearly half the number of heart attacks as the group eating vegetable oil, right? So, you know, so what does it basically say? Again, it's what we, what we knew all along, right? But the study was done back in the 60s, late 60s, early 70s, but it was then, it was then buried, right, until 2016 because it, it went completely in opposition to what the medical community was telling us. So basically, Again, every 30 point drop in cholesterol increased the risk by 22% um, uh, of death of cardiac disease. So uh, it's, it's crazy, right, that this stuff is, is being, um, um, being misled in the community. So um, 
so I kind of want to kind of open things up. Uh, if you have questions, there's you can kind of just ask them in the group chat, and I'll uh, definitely do my best to answer them right at this moment. So I know we've covered a lot of information. It's a little bit kind of like uh, kind of drinking out of a fire hose, <laughs> um, but I want to make sure that I answer any questions or ideas that we haven't addressed uh, specifically. So go ahead and just type them in that. Um, in that box, if you've uh, if you've got any, and uh, we'll just give it a minute, see if anybody types anything. So I'm guessing uh, this at least was was some new information for most of you. Hopefully, so I see someone's got a question. So go ahead and type it in the in the group chat box, and that way I can uh, can answer it that way. Great. I'll give it just a minute. So for those of you that are really looking for help and guidance in this, uh, this is part of what we do in the office. So when people come in, one of our first objective is, is to really assess where you're at and what your goals and objectives are. You know, so most people come up, come in with this, this objective that they just simply want to be healthier. They don't want to take a bunch of drugs. They know that that's not the answer. Uh, they need some guidance. They need some support. They need some encouragement. They need some accountability uh, to, to make sure that happens. So that's part of what we do in the office. Um, so if, you, if it's something that you want to come into the office and get checked out, uh, we would love to be able to help you. Um, we do have the, a little bit of the products we talked about here in the, uh, in the lecture. Uh, we do have available in the office. So um, I have taken the, the 20 years, almost 25 years I've been practicing to uh, weed through the, the myriad of uh, supplements that are out there that are, most of it are, is just junk. So the stuff uh, that we have here in the office, uh, we know that it actually does what it's supposed to do. And that way um, we can provide a quality product. And we also keep price in mind too. So uh, from a consumer perspective, it's important to, uh, to, to take, if you're gonna take something, take something that's quality, uh, but also make sure it fits in your budget. So we, we always do that. Uh, I'd also like to invite anybody that would like to come in uh, to the office to have a full assessment. Uh, our normal examination process for uh, a chiropractic uh, exam. And most people would ask, um, uh, I saw your question there, Brenda, I'll answer it in just a moment. Um, so um, uh, most people don't know that what we do chiropractically is we focus on the central nervous system function. And since your nervous system controls and coordinates literally every function within your body, um, including digestion and absorption uh, of all your uh, macro and micronutrients, um, if the nervous system isn't working right, your body can't function properly. So uh, that's what a chiropractor is specifically trained to do is correct uh, nerve interference. And nerve interference happens when we have too much stress. And stress can be physical, it can be biochemical, it can be mental, emotional. And um, the limiting factor for people is that it doesn't matter how great your diet is, it doesn't matter how great your exercise, um, you can't have a great enough diet, you can't have a great enough exercise to clear nerve system interference, right? Or the technical term is called a subluxation. So, so people want to come in and get checked. Uh, we normally charge $199 for examinations, but for our webinars, uh, if you contact us by the end of today and let our, uh, our team know uh, that you were on this webinar, um, we'll actually take $150 off of that assessment. So it's normally $199, but we'd actually be able to do it for $49 as long as you contact us by the end of business today, which is 6 o'clock. Uh, so Brenda, your question. So what are the best food sources of magnesium uh, and, uh, and our levels tested in routine blood tests? Um, so the, the best food sources really are going to be uh, fruits and vegetables. Uh, the darker the color, the better uh, is uh, a, a better choice. Um, and uh, it's not difficult to get enough magnesium as long as you're eating really rich foods. Um, and in volume as well. So uh, variety is key. 
um, if you've heard the idea that you should eat a rainbow every day. Right, so if everybody remembers from grade school, Roy G. Biv, right? Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Uh, by making sure you're getting every color every day, uh, you're probably gonna be in a pretty good position to have enough magnesium. Um, magnesium is typically not tested in a routine blood test. So um, I know you can request it to be done, um, it's also a pretty easy thing to, to get back on track. So some of the most, most common you know, symptoms are you know, muscle aches or fatigue. Um, and that doesn't mean like, oh, my low back is sore, I'm probably low in magnesium. It tends to be a body-wide effect. So kind of think of it from that particular perspective. Um, you know, magnesium just doesn't become low in your, you know, in your low back right it becomes low throughout your entire body so think of think of the symptoms as more uh, systemic or body-wide not uh, to a particular area when we have symptoms in a particular area and not throughout the body or in another or in the symmetrical side that tells us there's a problem and that the body is dysfunctioning so that would require looking a little deeper and finding out why that's happening um, so hopefully that answers your question Anybody have an, another question? Good, thanks for the thumbs up. <laughs> all right, well, there's a whole bunch of resources for this. If anybody wants uh, all of those resources, uh, there's a ton of them. <laughs> so um, definitely feel free to let me know and I'm happy to, uh, to send those to you. Um, and uh, so just thank you. Uh, for for taking your time to uh, to learn about this, uh, you know one of the things that I enjoy most is is working with the community and working with people that are engaged in generating a better quality of life for themselves. So the the fact that you're here and spending some time learning and investing your time into learning about how to be healthy and how to take care of yourself. Those are people we love working with. So uh, if you're not currently a practice member, um, we would love to serve you in the future. Um, definitely check out our website. Let us uh, kind of see what we do. Uh, lots of different cool stuff. Um, talk to some of our, our existing practice members. They love to share their amazing experiences of how their health has transformed. Uh, it's kind of what we've become known for uh, in Tucson. It is kind of like this, the headquarters for, for transforming health. Uh, and we do that all naturally. So. Uh, so thank you. That's a wrap. Have a great rest of the day. And uh, again, if you want to take advantage of the opportunity to come in as a, a new practice member here, uh, make sure you give us a call by the end of today. Uh, let us know that you were on today's webinar and we would love to serve you. Have a great, uh, great day. This is Dr. Cox signing off.